Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome friends, I'm Peter Herbeck for another week of the choices we face. St. John Paul II said that every Catholic deep in their hearts knows that Jesus Christ is risen, that he's alive, and that he's acting in the present, and that he's changing lives. Today's program is about how the Lord uses ordinary people to be sources of grace for people in need. And uh, our guest today is Michelle Delora. Michelle's going to share with us a story about how God reached out to touch her daughter. But before we get there, Michelle, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I connect very much actually with the way you just started. I, I, God is alive in my life and I've seen him work in miraculous ways. I'm a married woman, my husband, Tim, and I've been married for 36 years and we have two children. And now, how'd you meet Tim? Um, we met uh, as Peace Corps volunteers in Africa, actually, uh, and then continued in Africa, uh, actually got married in the church in Kathmandu. It was a big conversion story. And that's how our journey started together. Peace Corps workers. All right, yeah. great. Well, tell us a little story now about the story about your daughter, Angela, which mm -hmm. is kind of going to be the focus of our program. It's an amazing story. Yes. Well, our daughter, Angela, is an amazing young lady. She, um, when she was uh, 17, <clears throat> she graduated uh, valedictorian of her high school and um, came home. She graduated a year early, so she was going to take a gap year, do some mission work. She loved the Lord very much. I was very involved with um, leading young women and setting up camps for girls and that kind of thing. Um, and she was riding her bicycle home from work one day, about two months after graduation, and she was hit by a reckless driver. And uh, we were waiting for her to come home. Tim and I were, and as dusk started to fall, and we couldn't get a hold of her on her phone, and they told us she'd left from work already, um, my husband went out to find her, and when he got just, she, it was just a quarter mile from our house, the road was closed down, and the police were there, and they told him they had just taken a young lady to U of M hospital who was very seriously injured, and we knew that was our daughter. Her bicycle was there on the side of the road. Um, so he zipped home and pulled me out of my garden where I was watering flowers and we headed to the U of M hospital. So when you got to the U of M, what did you see? What happened? Well, they wouldn't let us see her. Okay. She was in such bad shape and they were really, they were fighting for her life right then. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so eventually they let us see her and it was very traumatic um, and they were, doing everything they could do, you know, intubating her. She was having a hard time breathing. Um, she'd obviously had a very serious accident. She was very bloody. And we just were, we tagged along through the whole night as they tried to save her life during the night. And providentially, um, there was a, a cancellation for a surgery the next morning so that they could go in and actually remove part of her skull I guess this is a common thing. I certainly hadn't known about it before in order to let the brain swell because it was going to swell. And if it would have swelled with the skull still there, death would have been imminent quickly. Um, so they, they zipped her into that surgery real early in the morning. But it was, it was touch and go then. She was in ICU and it was just touch and go every day, all day and all night. Yeah. For those days. So how long was she in the ICU and how long was she in the hospital? Well, 
um, jumping ahead, she, had, we, she was in the hospital for, it was August 25th when she was hit seven years ago. Um, and she got out on November 1st. Um, but she was in the ICU probably for two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. And each day, were you, what was it like being there each day? What were you seeing? What were you experiencing? <sighs> You know, God was present with us. I'll say that. There was an outpouring of prayer. Just all the young people. She was so connected with so many young people. They started immediately holy hours and prayer vigils right outside of the hospital. She had so many people coming in and gathering in the hospital waiting room, praying, praying, praying. Um, for me, it's, it's sort of a blur. My husband and I drew very near to each other, you know, and just worked as a couple being with her, we never left her for a minute. You know, she always had somebody with her praying. Um, but it was traumatic, you know. How long before she was responsive? Was she responsive to you? No. No, no she was in a coma. That. She was in a coma. She was in a coma. Yeah, she was in a coma. She tried to come out of a coma after about five days, but she, her, the doctors knew her brain wasn't, she, she wasn't ready for it. She need, so they had to put her back in. That's a, that gives you a little sense of who she is. She's a determined person. That fight for life was there. But um, she had to be put back under because the seriousness of her brain injury was needed time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as you uh, were there each day, did, were you able to see a little bit of progress in her each day? Or what was it like? It was just... No, so those first, that first week was just every day was just... We didn't know if we were going to lose her that day. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, you're, there are monitors everywhere, but she's plugged in to so many things. Um, but the one you kept your eye on was the brain pressure. And uh, you would watch that, and you didn't know when it would, and it would sometimes just go spiking high. And what that meant was, you know, brain damage um, and potential, you know, death mm -hmm. um, if it didn't come back down. And um, that, uh, that would happen every day. And the doctors would rush in, and they'd try to do something for her. And you know, many times they'd get it back down, but then the next day it'd go back up, or three hours later it would go back up. So uh, one day, <clears throat> we were um, sitting there. I was with my nephew, actually, because the family would come and help keep vigil with us. And it happened again, the brain pressure's up, 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 spiking to dangerous levels. And of course the doctors are in, a couple nurses are in, and they're doing their thing, and we're just praying. And actually that's the day that um, somebody came to me and said, Mrs. Delora, there's somebody here to see you. And I'm like, all right, who is coming to see me? My daughter's on death's door, <laughs> you know, who are these people who show up at the ICU, you know? And then they told me his name's Tom Nemi. And I had heard of Tom's name before. I knew that he had a healing ministry, and I knew that he had been connected with some of the women that Angela had been connected with at school. Okay. So I went out um, and brought him in the room, and that's when a lot started to happen. Yes. Yeah, so the in the room at the time, what was yeah. it like in the room at the time? You you were tense. There was very tense. tense. The doctors were very tense. You had doctors, you had nurses in the room, you had family yeah. and friends were all around. Were there no, people? it was just my nephew and I at that point. We'd, okay. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, probably I don't even remember who was in the room. Mm -hmm. I just remember medical people were in the room trying to do something to bring her brain pressures down. Yeah, so good. So we have, uh, as you know, we have Tom on the program today. We're, yeah. we're filming in the season of COVID, so COVID-19, yeah. so we have to be careful about how many people we can have on the set at the same time. But what we wanna do is we're gonna take a break right now, okay. and uh, we're gonna bring Tom on to describe what Tom's experience was in the moment. Mm -hmm. And then if it's okay with you, Michelle, I'd like to bring you back after that to describe what you saw and then the ongoing journey with sure. Angela, because God's work isn't finished no, in her. Not. She continues to be healed, and it's it's a miraculous in a kind of beautiful way, and there's so much more to it. So Good. friends, stay with us. We'll be back in just a minute. Ever feel like life's just too much? Maybe it's time for a change. God offers us relief and hope. So if you're feeling like you need more peace today, begin at catholicscomehome.com. Welcome back, friends. We're here now with Tom Namey. Tom, as, as Michelle mentioned in the first segment, as she's in the uh, IC unit with her daughter and doctors and nurses, her daughter had a severe head injury, critical 
condition. Uh, right in the midst of that, a stranger comes walking in, and the Lord begins to do something totally surprising to everybody who's in the room. And the Lord did it through our guests here, Tom Namey. Welcome, Tom. Thank you for having me. Yes, and Tom is the uh, director of Jesus Light of, of Life, Life Ministries. Ministries. Yeah, so Amen. anyway, Tom, so tell us now, how is it that you ever got connected with Angela and her situation and the, fam the Delora family? Well, um, in June, there was a girl named Bethany Bidwick who couldn't walk. She was losing her nerves, and she lost all her uh, muscle uh, strength. So they brought it to service, and she got healed instantly at ECRC, at Eastern Catholic Re-Evangelization Center. So because of that, I was invited to do a healing service in Oxford at the retreat hut in Oxford, Michigan. So I went there, and I did a healing service, and that night, the Holy Spirit came in like a cloud. It was amazing. Everybody was falling out before I could even ask them what their symptoms were, what they needed, prayer. And I remember they had a boarding school upstairs. There was like 40 young girls. And all these girls went out and then, and none of them woke up. None of them could get out of the the spirit, they were just slain in the spirit. Okay, you meant the Holy Spirit, in the midst of prayer, the Holy Spirit just came and touched them. And I, it was like, I've never seen nothing like it. That was amazing what happened that night. Okay. And then I had to pray for each one of them to awaken, and they did, and they, as a, they were awakening, they started speaking in tongues, and they started prophesying, and it was crazy. One of them was a Latino girl, that started speaking in Chaldean and Aramaic. And she was like, I am Jesus, come to me. And, and one of my prayer partners, the girls who were with me, was like, oh my God, she's speaking Aramaic. I said, yeah. She didn't say she was Jesus. She was just saying Jesus was speaking. It's through her. Got it, got it, okay. So one of the girls received the gift of prophecy. I don't know her name. So after that, about a month later, I was uh, sleeping. It was about 12.30. I, I used to go to, to work at 2 in the morning. I had a produce company. So every morning I woke up at 2 in the summertime at 1, and I get a phone from Jenna Cray, who was one of the consecrated women at Oxford, and she was like, Tom, can you raise somebody from the dead? I said, only if Jesus wants to. I can do anything through Christ. If Christ said so, I can do it. She said, well, there's a young lady named Angela Delora got hit by a car, and her skull is crushed, and she is at Mott's Hospital, and she's dying. I said, well, if her family would call me, I'll come down right now, but I need her family to call me, because sometimes I go to the hospital, and the family is like in... They're in panic, and they don't want some stranger walking sure. in, want to pray with them, they, and then they question all that. So I've had some, some sour ordeal through my ministry. Sure. And it's as it should be. I mean, the parents should know. Who's right. Going. Yeah, sure. So I didn't get a call. I didn't get a call from her family. And Friday, I waited. I didn't get a call. Saturday, I waited. I didn't get a call. Sunday, I went to church. I took Eucharist to this one young man, and uh, I went home. I was tired. I usually sleep a couple of hours, and then I used to get up, do all my billing and stuff, get ready for Monday. And as soon as I went to take a nap, my phone rang, and it was one of the girls who got the gift of prophecy. And this time, I think she's in Montana. So she says to me, Tom, you know, since you prayed for me, I, get, I received the gift of prophecies, and today I was laying in church and I saw this young lady riding her bike. She got hit by a car. She's a blonde-haired girl. And uh, when you walk in, soon as you're gonna lay hands on her, our blessed mother is gonna take her veil and put it on her, and she will be instantly healed. Well, that was music to my ears because I've been waiting anxiously. I was praying for Angela, but I didn't get a phone call, and I figured, well, maybe she passed away, maybe not. I didn't know what was going on. And I, that word coming from the Lord, I said, I got to go to the hospital quickly. So I get up, and I drive like 120 miles an hour, boom, to Mott Hospital. So I drove to Mott, and uh, I went to, 
to the reception desk. I was like, I want to see Angela Delore. And she told me, well, uh, she's in critical condition. I said, yeah, I need to see her. She's going to get healed today. And she said, 10th floor. So I went up to 10th floor. And I, I asked the young lady at the desk, I want to see Angela Delore. And she said, uh, who are you? I said, Tom Namey. She said, she's in critical condition. And she, they can't see no visitors. I said, she's going to get healed today. She said, wait one minute. She picks up the phone. She calls this young lady. Her mom comes up. And she goes, who are you? I go, we don't have time for all that. I need to see Angela right now. And she cried. So I cried. <laughs> yeah. I cried. I said, come on. It's time for Jesus. Move. So we walked in the room. It was a big room. And when we walked in the room, there was a doctor with two nurses. Angela had a sign over her forehead, do not touch beyond this area. She was out cold. And the two nurses were saying, well, we gave her this, we gave her that. She's not responding. And we gave her this. And the doctor was like, did you give her this medicine or whatever or shoot her with a needle or something? I don't I got on my knees. I was like, look, Lord, you sent me to come here. This is for your glory. These guys, apparently, they're in panic. I use the word buffoons. I said, they don't look like they know what they're doing right now. Make sure they don't kill this girl. I said, this is for your glory. I'm going to get up and pray with her. And her mom was praying with me. Michelle was praying with me. And I got up and I anointed Angelo. Angela, and I, I put the cross on her forehead, on her wrist, on her legs. And as soon as we said, Lord Jesus, we give you the glory for the healing in the name of Jesus, we speak life over this dead flesh. The next thing I know, the two nurses and mom, they're all like, 17, 17, 17. I was like, you know, what's so important about 17? In the medical field, I've heard, of, you know, Blood pressure, 98, 99, heartbeat, this and that. But 17, I never heard of. But they were happy. They were excited. So I figured whatever happened is good. I left, and Michelle came after. She was, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. My job is done. She said, no, come on here. I'll introduce you to my family. Well, I went in there, and everybody was back there. And they were, they, I guess they came to say goodbye, and I told them, Angela's not going to die. She's going to live. Mother Mary promised that she's going to put her veil on her, and she will live. And an hour later, they received a gift from one of her, Michelle's friends. At the hospital, a gift came for her? For her. OK. Yeah. And, and the gift was a, mother, a blanket of Mother Guadalupe. So they laid it on her, and they, and they posted it on Facebook. And I was moved by it. Yeah. And um, she got well. That was it. She just got healed after that. And it's amazing how, you know, the word of the Lord never goes back come to no void. Isaiah 55, 11 says, so once the Lord gives me the word like through someone or it comes to me, I know that person will be healed. It's always getting healed. Yeah. Like and sometimes I have healing service, services and this one lady was telling me that, you know, her back was healed. Uh, her back was hurting all the time, but the Lord told me, "No, she has one foot shorter than the other." I told, "Do you have one foot shorter than the other?" And she was like, "Yes." How did you know? I said, "Well, you don't know how smart I am." You don't. <laughs> yeah, right. I, yeah. So I took her up and I set it on the front of everybody. And Mother got, and her foot was inch and a half shorter than the other one. But because the Lord told me that her foot is shorter. I knew that the Lord was going to heal her right away. And the Lord healed her. She got up and walked with two even feet. You know, one of, the, one of the most beautiful things about this story and why I'm so glad both you and Michelle were able to be here today, and we're going to hear from Michelle again in a few minutes, is that the Lord, number one, the Lord, the ways the Lord works. You know, you were ministering to these uh, high school age girls at, at Oxford at this retreat or conference, and these girls are deeply touched. One of the girls 
you know, comes alive in the Holy Spirit, you know, and the church, the, the scripture is so clear, you know, that to each has been given a manifestation of the spirit for the common good. And St. Paul said, I wish that you could all prophesy. And these things are part of the normal Christian life with ordinary people, not just, not just specially set aside people. And here this girl is come alive. And then she, at a critical time when you're at home and you're, you're, you, you know, you know, the situation you want it, you feel like you're supposed to go pray, but you, you don't know if you should go because the parents haven't called you. And then this girl on the other side of the country calls another you and state. says another state. And she has this picture of a blonde girl on a bicycle who gets hit and she's critical and dying. And our lady is going to put her veil on her. So you go in obedience to the Lord. You know, that's just the way the Holy Spirit works. And in, in that moment of obedience, you know, you pray the prayer. It's very clear things have changed in the moment. It's not completely healed, but it's definitely changed. And it's going in the right direction. And you leave and then a veil comes, a gift comes in the mail that had to be sent days before. And it's a picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And they end up putting it on Angela over her. And it's, it's just such a beautiful way. And I think, friends, it's so important for us to realize as baptized Catholics that, you know, the grace of Pentecost is for everybody. And everybody literally has been given the gifts of the Holy Spirit in different ways, individual gifts. And the Lord wants all of us to be able to be open to the direction of the Holy Spirit to build up the body in Jesus so we can fulfill the Lord's commands. He said, heal the sick. You know, raise the dead and these kinds of things. So, but Tom, uh, thank you so much. Thank you You're so much welcome. for but sharing. You know, I want to add one oh. more thing. Okay. I remember Janet Craig called me and she was like, Tom, they said that she got healed, but she's not completely healed. I said, no, God will heal her. They said, well, she, she won't be able to remember. I said, she will remember. God is going to completely heal because our God is a mighty God. Amen. And he did. Glory to God. Amen. Tom, thanks for being with us. Friends, we're going to be back Thank in you. just a moment. And uh, Michelle Delora will tell us the rest of the story. Amen. If you want to change the culture today, it's not enough to have a heart full of good intentions and enthusiasm. You have to have a mind deeply formed in our Catholic faith. All Catholics are called to be a part of the new evangelization. Some of us are called to serve in the church and be leaders. Then we want to be like Peter and the apostles and the other great saints who dropped their nets and followed Christ and answered the call. Welcome back, friends. This is Peter Herbeck. You're watching The Choices We Face, and we're here again with Michelle Delora. Now, Michelle is, is the mother of the young woman that we've been talking about, Angela, who had this terrible head injury. And in the last segment, Tom Namey described the dynamics of what happened. And he said, I, I went upstairs into the hospital room, and the mother came out, and I met the mother, and she's like, who are you, and what are you doing here? So can you explain from there, like, what was your experience of what happened, what unfolded? Yeah, well, the thing is, I actually did know who Tom was. Okay. I had known of him, and I actually had been at Oxford for a okay. healing service he'd had given, and so had Angela. So there was, it is interesting to see how so many little things are connected that we didn't even know. Yeah. And this is just an unfolding. And once I saw him and realized who he was, yeah, I was so pleased that he came in. And he came in just as you saw him here, himself, right? Yeah. And he had the scripture in one hand, and he was walking around the room just proclaiming God's word over Angela. And the doctors, I suppose in the ICU of any hospital, they're accustomed to all kinds of people coming to pray maybe. Yeah. So they were just every once in a while kind of looking at him. And he, he felt completely free to be walking around the room, worshiping God and proclaiming God's word over her. And when he said 17, 17, that was, that was the meant the brain, the pressures because the pressures had been up into the twenties, 26, 20, dangerous pressure, uh, brain pressure coming down, coming down, coming down. My nephew and I were just sitting there watching the monitor maybe 10 minutes after the prayer, you know, it was taking maybe just 10 minutes and then down, down, down. And they hit 17, which was like the good number, right? Okay. And they never went back up after that. Thanks be to God. So that was a moment of change in Angela's condition. And the, and just briefly, the, the, the veil, the whole, the oh. moment of Our Lady. And I know you have a deep <laughs> devotion to Our Lady. And you know, already Angela had consecrated her gap year to Our Lady of Guadalupe. She Is had already right? done that. Oh, wow. And, you know, afterwards we, we visited with Tom for a little bit. And then we walked him to the elevator. I don't know if Tom remembers this, but off the elevator comes a really good looking African-American guy. 
Um, and he has this big t-shirt on. And on the front of it is just Our Lady of Guadalupe. And we went, whoa. Yeah. And he said, yeah, she's my main woman. <laughs> so, yeah. And then a few hours later, we were sitting quietly with peacefully in our daughter's room because she was calm. She was still in the coma. But, you know, things had stabilized.